Time for a deep dive into the one issue that matters most in a capitalist democracy, money. This is Maggie and the Millionaires Talking Money, a joint production of the Maggie Dawn Show and the Patriotic Millionaires. Now, let's start talking money. Welcome, Wisconsin and beyond. I'm Maggie Dawn. You are listening to the Maggie Dawn Show here on the Civic Media Radio Network. It is three o'clock, and that means it is Maggie and the Millionaires Talking Money. Uh, this week, we have been talking to begin the week all about labor and working people. And I'm so excited to be joined by the OG of the PMs, the original guy from the Patriotic Millionaires, one of my favorite guests for this segment, Morris Pearl. He's the board chair of the Patriotic Millionaires. And previously, Mr. Pearl was a managing director at BlackRock, one of the largest investment firms in the world. He had a long tenure on Wall Street. Um, And we're here to dig in to how we should be structuring this economy so that it so that it works for working people. Welcome back, Morris. It's a pleasure to have you. Hey, great to be with you, Maggie. Let's just jump right in. Last week, the big news from an economic perspective was the longshoreman strike, of course. Could have shut down our nation's ports uh, for quite some time. JP Morgan estimated it would cost about $5 billion a day from the U.S. economy. Looks like we've averted that disaster for now, but it's it was about an issue that we've seen over and over and over again, and that is the corporations were making record profits, and the workers came to the table and said, let me share in that. And that's really the centerpiece of of your book that's coming out this December, Pay the People, Why why Fair Pay is Good for Business and Great for America. And so let's begin there. How should companies balance corporate profits and worker pay? What's your answer for that? Well, look, I mean, to paraphrase Winston Churchill, capitalism is the worst possible system, except for every other system that's ever been tried. Right. However... The free market does not always work for labor. We did have a totally free market for labor in the past. President Lincoln ended that with the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863. Now, putting aside the details of the longshoremen in this particular dispute, which has a lot of details here and there, when one large employer can monopolize the employment opportunities for the whole community, that employer has an advantage that capitalism and the free market and Adam Smith's invisible hand can not deal with. We need to have regulations, just as we've long recognized that we have regulations on electric utilities. There's probably only one place you can get electricity. They could raise the prices and you pretty much need electricity to get by. So our states have laws about regulating how monopolists like the electric company work. We also need regulations on how people who have monopolies in the labor market can work, both employers and unions. And those need to be regulated. We need to have the society make some rules, not just the rich and powerful making the rules. And so, yeah, that's the answer. And we do that by voting. I mean, we do not have a direct democracy. Our choices are presented to us in the ballot boxes. And and I think, you know, there has been a lot of consternation about, listen, people feel like they are getting left behind, that they keep working harder and they don't get ahead. And my response to that has been, you're right. That is what's happening. But the solution isn't more tax breaks for billionaires, millionaires, and the largest, most profitable companies. It's we've got to fix the way the tax system works. We've got to fix the way wages and working conditions are regulated. Specifically, we've talked about the fact that worker productivity goes up, but we haven't seen a corresponding increase in wages. So where is all this money going? If if corporations have record profits and worker productivity is going up, Who's taken all the money from all those record profits and all that increase in profit uh, pro, uh, well, productivity? The word productivity means 
how much stuff is produced per hour of labor. Total amount of stuff divided by total number of hours, that's productivity. It's going up. That means there's more value being produced per hour of labor. Now, the thing is, though, that the total amount of value includes corporate profits, which you just said 30 seconds ago are going up at record highs. That's part of the numerator of productivity. So that's exactly it. The total income includes the billions of dollars that investors and people like Elon Musk that owns Tesla are making. So yes, the total income of everyone in the country has gone up a lot. But most of that increase has gone to a tiny number of people who are the investors and the owners of these businesses, like Mr. Musk and people who invest in the stock market like me. We're making a lot more money. So if you average us all out, yeah, the average income of the country has gone up. But if you only look at the 99%, it's not really gone up much at all. And that's the problem is that all of the increase value has gone to a tiny number of people at the top and very little has gone to the actual people who work for a living. It does not trickle down. <laughs> it trickles up. It, uh, two questions about that. The first one, perhaps the most important, which is why? Why Why is, that, is it that we've seen over these last 20 years that this massive increase in income is only going to the top 1% and all of us, uh, everybody else, including me and everybody listening, is getting left behind. Because people have voted for their elected representatives on the theory that, oh, we need to reduce regulation. We need to let the rich get richer so that the values will all trickle down to everyone else. They've somehow accepted the idea that the way to be successful is to appease the rich and famous people. You know, it's like what Donald Trump said in The Apprentice, you have to treat celebrities special. Mm. And people have believed it. They've been saying it since Ronald Reagan in the 1980s that, oh, if you make the rich people get even richer, that will, I don't even know what the next rest of the sentence is, but somehow help them. And then it doesn't work. If you make the rich people get richer, what you get is richer, rich people. If you want to help people that work for a living get richer, you should send money to people who work for a living, not the very rich. Money does not trickle down. Money trickles up. Every time you pay your iPhone bill or your mortgage payment or something, people like me who invest in Apple and invest in banks that make mortgages get a little bit richer. And that's how I can just sit here and look at my computer while well, you have to work for a living and I'm getting richer. Now, when you say send money to working people, you don't mean handouts. Oh, my goodness, that, that word, right? What you're talking about is increases in wages and benefits, investments in public education, in infrastructure. Tell, when you say investing or sending to working people, what do you mean by that, Morris? Well, what I mean could be reducing their taxes mm -hmm. so that they get a bigger paycheck to take home through like things like the earned income tax credit and the child tax credit, doing things with those, that would be nice. That could mean increasing the minimum wage. That would be helping a lot of people. The uh, act we've been promoting, the American Stability Act, involves increasing the minimum wage and decreasing people's taxes for minimum wage workers. It could involve things, things like that. It could involve changing the rules so that unions are allowed to organize people more easily. And then the people can demand higher wages from their monopolistic employers that control the labor markets. Those are the kinds of things that frankly can make America like it had been when I was growing up and give my children and grandchildren the kind of opportunities that I had when I was young. What do you say, Morris? First of all, but just a real basic uh, 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 sort of level setter. Does the data show what you and I are describing here? Yes. Yes, completely. 
since 1973, the top 1% had 9% of all the income in the country. Now it's over 26%. As a percentage of the income in the country, they have tripled their share. The bottom group, the bottom fifth, their share has gone from like 4% to 3%. That's like a 25% decrease in the relative share that people at the bottom have, where the people at the top have tripled their share. And yeah, huge amounts of wealth have moved from people that work for a living to people who, who inherit money for a living and invest it. And just another data point related to the longshoremen, the shipping industry raked in a record breaking 400 billion with a B billion dollars in profits since 2020. By some calculations, that is an 800 percent increase in their profits. That is profits. That is not gross revenues. That is profits. So 800 percent increase. And you had the longshoremen union saying, we would like a 70% increase, a 75% increase in our wages. And I think they settled around 65%. I think that's still a, an absolute steal for the corporate overlords with their 800% increase in corporate profits. My very special guest this half hour is Morris Pearl, the board chair of the Patriotic Millionaires, previously managing director at BlackRock, one of the largest investment firms in the world. He worked for a long time on Wall Street. He's the co-author of Tax the Rich, How Lies, Loopholes, and Lobbyists make the rich richer. How do we fix this? I know we've got to get out and vote, but if somebody out there is is listening and they think, I th Donald Trump's good for the economy, I'm going to vote for him again. Donald Trump sent me a tax refund. What do you say to somebody who's thinking that? Well, sure. I got, I pay less tax. I pay less taxes after the Trump tax cuts in 20, 27, you know, 2018 too. Yep. Yeah, I mean, if I was voting based on how I would make more money, sure, I'd vote for Trump every day. But no, I don't want to vote based on me making more money this year. I want to vote based on my children and my grandchildren having the kind of opportunities that I had. That's the I difference. first guest on this segment, Maggie and the Millionaires Talking Money, Morris Pearl. He's the board chair of the Patriotic Millionaires, worked on Wall Street for a, for a long time. He was a director at BlackRock. He's written a couple of books about how to restructure our economy so that it works for the middle class. One of those books is coming out this December. It's called Pay the People, Why Fair Pay is Good for Business and Great for America. Uh, Morris, just before the break, I wanted to ask you to clarify a little bit. I asked you if someone's listening, and I should make this clear, if someone's listening and they work for a living and they're thinking, Donald Trump's good for me, what do you say to that person? First of all, Donald Trump is a lot better for the rich people and the high income people than is the people who are actually working for a living. I mean, sure, you may be doing okay, but a huge amount of the wealth of our country has been shifted from the people who are working to the people who are investing and owning businesses and companies. I mean, I can say it's that the 20, the tax cuts that took place in 2018 are very good for me, but that's not what I'm voting based on my own personal benefit. Mm. And I just, just to clarify, being, having a high income is one thing, being rich is an entirely different right. thing. People can get in, income going up and up and up, and they pay more and more and more taxes. And our tax system could be more progressive, but it is kind of progressive. But the really rich barely pay any tax at all. Yeah. I have a lower tax rate on my e income than you do. Yeah. And it's because we only have an income tax in this country and if you're really rich, you don't need any income. So we have to make fundamental changes if we actually want rich people to pay taxes. And it's not just raising their tax rates. It's changing the way we run the tax system so that people who make money pay some part of that money in taxes. And we don't have this narrow definition that income means money from your paycheck. 
Yeah. That gets deducted every week. Income is anything that increases your wealth by a dollar and why we treat different dollars differently continues to be a mystery to me. I want to take out one of our callers here, Morris, because I think they queue up one of the questions I wanted to ask you. Hey, Billy, what do you have for Morris? What was your comment or question? Hi, thanks for taking my call. Um, just a uh, Referring to your conversation about, you know, um, people that are having difficulty keeping up and uh, the kind of idea of monopoly employers, um, you know, I'm not working for the, uh, the corporate overlords. I'm in public education, but, um, you know, I, I don't know if everybody understands that because of Act 10, um, you know, teachers can ask for, uh, districts can give up to the consumer price index. Yeah, so what Billy is asking for, I just want to jump in here to translate because Morris might not be familiar with Act 10. In the state of Wisconsin, we limited public employee unions to to only be able to bargain for a cost of living increase. The general question that Billy points to is what role does organized labor play in fixing this problem of how wage earners, those that work for a living, are treated? Well, frankly, it should play a bigger role than it actually does. Just as an employer can say, oh, I'll pay what the market rate is for this labor. Well, the employees should be able to say, we want to be paid the market rate for our labor. And there's no reason why unions, which are just groups of employees bargaining together collectively, should have more constraints (coughs) than employers have. I think that unions need to be able to bargain on behalf of their members and make the same demands for a group of members that an individual can make for his own employment. Yeah, the the restrictions around public employee union bargaining in the state of Wisconsin are draconian, to say the least, right out of the billionaire handbook in this case. Um, A follow up question. What is the proper role? What role should the government play in fixing this imbalance between corporations and workers, both from a wage labor perspective and a tax perspective? Look, when when an, when a worker applies for a job with a big store like Walmart or an airline or a big company that makes cars or something, generally they're told what the wages are for that job and they can take it or leave it. And because of the size of the employer and the employee has very little bargaining power, but having a union can make the difference. A union can go to the worker, they go to the employer and say, we represent all of the employees. And then they have more or less equal bargaining power. One employer, one group of employees. And unions should have more of a role. They used to. And frankly, America, a lot of Americans were doing a lot better back in the day when unions did have a much bigger role. Jack from Merrimack, be quick. We only have about a minute and a half left. What's your question for Morris? Well, you hear people uh, that that are not in favor of taxing the rich saying, but you're trying to redistribute wealth. Well, isn't it true? We are already redistributing wealth. It's just if, if you could, Morris, I, we've just got a little bit of time. Thanks, Jack. Yeah, I mean, a huge amount of wealth has been redistributed since the 2017 tax laws <clears throat> from people who work for a living to the, to the very well, the wealthy investors. And yeah, I would like to see a little more distributed towards people who work for a living, people who spend their money, people who buy stuff, people who contribute to the economy, as opposed to just people who want to sit there and watch the balances in their accounts get bigger which doesn't really help the rest of us. Just to put a fine point on my most fine guests, concluding statements here, remember, in 1973, the top 1% took home 9% of this country's income. But today, the top 1% take home 26.5% of this country's income. That's the redistribution of wealth away from working people to the billionaire and multi, 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 multi millionaire class. Thanks so much, Morris. It is always a pleasure to see you, my friend. That's going to do it for today's installment of Maggie and the Millionaires Talking Money here on the Civic Media Radio Network. Thanks for listening to Maggie and the Millionaires Talking Money a joint production of Civic Media and the Patriotic Millionaires. For more information, go to patrioticmillionaires.org. And be sure to tell your friends. 
The Patriotic Millionaires buy advertising across a number of civic media stations.